think I'm an imaginative artist. I use my intuition and I, I use my sense of you know, finding things within the, the marks that are made. And my journey with the rocks, um, it started with um, um, basically marking colours on paper and, and finding things within those um, within the patterns of the uh, marks that you make on the paper. Oh. Are you struggling with painting from photographs? Today's guest is going to talk about her process where she actually uses intuitive painting and memories and experiences from her childhood. What is unique within this way, I, I am understanding, and we'll hear about this today, is uh, put away the frustration and paint with what's right in front of you, with the materials and the paper, and look for full exploitation where you're going to make new discoveries. And uh, if this is your first time, my name is Gabriel Stockton, and we are here doing interviews with pro artists about their watercolors. So without any further ado, my good friend Caroline Diebel, who is a brand ambassador of Daniel Smith. Enjoy. And I'm so glad to have you join us for this new series. We've done these interviews with artists to help you find your next steps with watercolor. And I'm stoked to have this second series now. We are going all the way to Australia to talk to my good friend, Caroline. Fantastic. Thanks for having me. Exciting to be here today. So it's really sunny and beautiful out here in San Diego and warm. And what is the weather like there for you? Oh, it's overcast. It's cool. We are officially in winter here in Australia, but it's not freezing today, which is um, a godsend. You know, we've, we've got to meet each other. We were at Fabiano together in Italy. And we got a chit chat and I got to watch you paint one of your amazing rock paintings. So before we get to the rock paintings, could you give us a snippet of what it looked like you in your art journey? Were you a kid doing art? Was it later in life? What, what is your story? Okay, yeah, I think I have a lifelong story. I think most visual thinkers are similar to me. Uh, I've always loved and been passionate about painting and drawing. Um, I have tried and dabbled in every art form, every art medium, as many artists do in their journey. And as a, um, uh, a student, I, it was my favourite subject. Um, in fact, I'm still now heavily connected to my year 10 and my year 12 art teachers from more than 30 years ago. Um, through that journey, they inspired so much of my passion to um, um, I suppose belong in a world that I thought in and and coming together like with you in Fabriano it's just an amazing experience to be with so many like-minded people. Um, as a young adult I started working in the school system and I worked as a technical assistant to fine arts. Um, I had the privilege of of basically looking after a whole arts department with hundreds and hundreds of students in every medium. So I successfully became quite proficient in every medium you could suggest because in schools that's what we do. We teach kids lots and lots of things and take them on a journey of discovery and encourage them to um, find their place in the art world through exploration with lots of different mediums. Um, once I had my kids, I... You know, home mum um, had our small business, I always did all the bookwork and things like that for our business, but on the side I always painted. And so I've been exhibiting since my early 20s, so telling a little, little bit of the truth here about nearly 40 years of exhibiting in my life. Um, so it's been um, not a new journey, but a lifelong journey, my, my art thing. And... Through the exploration of the arts, I found um, water-soluble inks. Um, I had a really good play through some favourite artists that I really loved. Um, 
I suppose create my imagination, my, you know, recreate it onto paper. And the inks gave me a journey which was interesting, which led me to watercolour. And here I am today, um, now being seriously almost a full-time watercolourist for the last 10 years and really, really enjoy that amazing experience and opportunities it's brought me, including meeting people like you. Well, this is so cool because I wanted to uh, ask you all these things, but we talked about so many other things uh, in Italy. And the one of the things that uh, is exciting about doing these interviews is my beginning students can find new areas, new camps of watercolor to go. And your work is very unique. Even about the, the way you start your painting, you like just dripped, you know, some, some paint down onto the surface of the paper. You didn't mean draw yet. Uh, can no. you explain your process of your rocks watercolor painting? Sure, the rock watercolor painting came through, I think I'm an imaginative artist. I use my intuition and I, look, I use my sense of you know, finding things within the, the marks that are made. And my journey with the rocks, um, it started with um, um, basically marking colours on paper and, and finding things within those, um, within the patterns of the uh, marks that you make on the paper. And uh, the discovery of finding uh, rock pools within my work was not completely by accident because that was something that really took me um, in my imagination to my childhood. Um, I spent many years fly fishing with my dad and spending many, many hours on the side of, of river streams and, and, and small lakes and things looking out for the fish and see if I could see them in the water. And this imagination thing is actually a part of a life journey of, um, of memory. And when I looked at the marks on the paper, I found um, I could see um, pieces of those memories um, come looking back at me. So it was a matter of then tickling the, the, the marks on the paper to actually bring an image from it. So starting very abstract and then actually becoming quite a controlled image through exploration of, of finding as opposed to having a photograph with me that you're copying in, in some way. My, um, my work is literally just intuitive and I just work on the page as the page asks me um, for colour or depth or, or tone or whatever it, whatever it is that actually builds the work up. Um, uh, what I try to find is depth and layers within um, the work so I could see literally into the water and I could get that emotional connection that I, I have in my memories of my childhood. I love hearing the emotional part. I love hearing that this came from actual your upbringing. And I love hearing uh, how you, uh, you, you know, you envision as it develops, it kind of like morphs into this a uh, piece that's very uh, abstract to something that comes really nice and solid. But could you tell us kind of like uh, your actual process, like technical nerdy side? Do you stretch your <laughs> paper? Do you tape it down? What do you sure. do? <laughs> well, having worked with young students for so many years in schools, I worked out that I didn't like the old brown tape that you put on with water. And I use simple, boring old masking tape. Um, I've tried a few different brands. Um, I've even tried the green frog tape and the blue tape. Um, I've gone back to the simple, boring, cream-coloured masking tape. Um, I found the coloured tapes distracted the colour of the image um, and so the cream is actually a neutral. Um, I sometimes wet the paper both sides depending on what I'm actually doing. Sometimes I'm literally painting and leaving my initial marks in dry and then letting that settle and completely dry before I develop um, the ongoing layers. And some of my rock paintings can be up to 20 layers deep and can take 40 or 50 hours in, in, in developing um, their style. I know that when I, um, I, I did for you overseas when we were in Italy, it was a quick work. It was, it was a, a suggestion of the style that I do, um, but it was a lot of fun and it was an example of, of the, um, the concept of what I do. 
um, once I've found those first layers and those first marks and then I find my rock pool, I then allow um, the rocks to form, um, you know, off the tip of my brush as I see, um, I suppose, the marks on the page are, are literally giving me a guide um, as, I, as I find the space. Sometimes there's uh, lots and lots of rocks and sometimes there's few. Um, and on my adult journey in my art, I've um, taken a big interest in um, oceanic um, rock pools. And so the, um, the journey of um, finding, um, I suppose, from snorkelling and, you know, visiting beaches and, and, and tropical reefs and things like that, um, the amazing colours. And I'm a really colourful artist. So it really drew me into um, adding a lot more colour to my work and the, um, the oceanic work allows me to sort of explore that really bold colour. Um, Technically, I think it's just about layers and finding finding the place in the picture. Um, and they just evolve. They're imagination pieces. They're not from photos. They're not from anything. They're just from literally emotional connections to my experiences. I I really enjoyed it. It was here, it, folks. If you could just picture this, there were some rocks. There were some things that looked like rocks, and then she started building these layers, and there was rocks. And then she brought this flow of water and where some of the water was running through and over some. And then she decided to fill it up with a little more water. And so there, the rocks kind of had, you know, just still bubbling up from the water. And then she brought the water a little deeper. Then she added some leaves and dropped in these wonderful shadows and, it was, <laughs> and these layers upon layers and, it almost, if we would have videoed it, it would have it almost like been an animated kind of movie. And would you say that this style of yours is teachable? Um, I think it's teachable, but I still think um, it's a journey that I took on my own to sort of um, explore watercolour, explore ink. That, that, that's where my journey started. The fact that I found a, an amazing topic that I really, really resonated with, that gives me the ability to actually understand if the picture's working because it is coming from, you know, snapshots of photos in my brain as such of what water looks like and what the depths look like and, and thinking about all the components. And as you said, putting um, the marks on the rocks first and finding the rocks, finding the shadows in the three form, um, of the uh, of the actual rock surfaces and then deciding hey, if I'm going to flood water in and where it's going to flood to and how fast is that water current flowing and all those sort of things. It's all things that you can teach but you still need to have people understand what it is that they're doing. Um, a lot of people can be taught by copying a picture and we're going to do this and we're going to do that and this is the mark, this is what it's going to look like, that sort of thing. Whereas mine is very intuitive work um, and I have taught it in um, to some adult classes um, with some success without question, but um, I think the biggest success comes with all of our art is lots and lots of practice, doing it over and over and over. And the style that I've built up in my rock work has been a journey of discovery over many, many, many years. It wasn't just an instant, we're going to do this. And it's going to work. It was many, 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 you know, days and days and days of trial and error of finding how the layers worked and how the um, the marks left on the page. But the watercolour is what gave me the excitement about those layers because of the beautiful transparencies and what I could actually do. I could choose to put shadows in the first layer or the last layer or add things. I could flow water and still be able to see the rocks in the clear water because of the transparency of the watercolour. All those things, of course, can be taught, but limited to um, somebody's ability to actually foresee their image evolving. I love that. You just answered my next question is, uh, mm -hmm. that second half part of that question was, does it come with experience? And that's what you just said. You said, yes, it can be taught, but the fact you do need to have some experience. And I love that. that uh, just with anything else, if we were baking cookies, we would need some mileage before we opened up a bakery. And uh, sure. you explained that really well. 
My next question is, is um, some people, um, yes, they paint with a lot of boldness. Uh, they're loose and breaking rules. Um, are there must follow rules uh, when painting? Um, I think I'll say the classic term rules are there for a reason, but they're also allowed to be broken. Uh, I think it's that experience we talked about that an, uh, so you have an understanding of when you break the rule, what will happen, and so that you don't actually completely destroy your painting. Um, it's really easy to make mud. We all know that as an artist, and we've experienced that with young people, the, the classic, you know, three, three colour um, primaries uh, mixed together is just khaki brown. So, um, yes, um, rules are there for a reason, but... Um, with understanding that can be broken very successfully, which can then add you know, sort of, I suppose, nuances to your own work and um, uniqueness to the marks you make. I think that's sort of the best way to explain that, yeah. That's so good. And, and I know probably some people are wondering, like, do you do plain air painting? And they <laughs> want to know if you work from photos at all or... Is it only intuitive? What does that look like for you? Okay, I think um, being a visual thinker, you're excited by lots and lots of imagery around you. I think, you know, typically, you know, my feed and my, on, on my um, iPhone or on my iPad is full of images because that's what I'm searching for. It, it comes back at you. So it, it, it introduces you to more and more people and more and more artists and more art styles. I love photography. I love capturing photos. I think my phone's up to about 60,000 photos on it. So definitely collect images. <laughs> However, do I refer to my images while I paint? Um, not often. I think I collect them for the idea of finding the energy, finding the, um, the experience, the, uh, I keep saying emotional connection. I, wanna, I want my paintings to give you a feeling of, uh, of euphoria, of, of literally um, a calming, um, a pleasant, you know, sort of experience. Um, so painting to hardly from a hard, you know, photo literally onto your page, it's not something I personally do with my style. Um, however, I've just been painting um, a piece for the Australian Watercolour Muster over the last few days. And I felt that it needed a really cool shadow of some sort in the picture that wasn't about the rocks. And because it's for a exhibition that's going to be in tropical North Queensland, I thought it needed the shadow of a palm tree. So I went, of course, onto the internet to find shadows of palm trees, which, you know, sometimes is an easy find when, depending on the topic you're looking for and sometimes it's a hard one. So definitely it was um, something that I used um, to my advantage because I don't have palm trees in my area. It's not something I'm familiar with painting with all the time and, and painting things that you're not familiar with out of your imagination, they don't really work out as well. So, you know, having visual guides around you is definitely something um, I, you know, encourage um, any student, any art student to, to have, but not necessarily copy it, but just use the, the concept of it. That's so good. I love hearing this. And uh, you said something and you talked about emotional content. And I know right now we're in this like phase of just we're still a little separated since this whole 2020 thing. But I still I'm seeing people I even had someone today come into my studio and they had an emotional and they really they started like feeling something and remembering you know, could you, you know, this is something where you kind of draw within yourself. There's like this well of water in your, in yourself. Can, so can you explain uh, where you're, where, what you mean by, you know, grabbing within yourself for that emotional, uh, like, process? Sure. So I, I see you're finding hard to find the right words to even explain it. I might find that I find it hard to find the right words as well. Um, I think I don't know. I think a lot of artists are quite emotional people. I think they really connect with the 
with the journey and they either love something or they don't necessarily hate it, but it's like, oh, no, that's not my thing. I don't really like that. But I think any picture that we do, we paint or we're inspired to love in a gallery, um, I can love a picture in a gallery because I really admire the skill in the, in the actual painting of the picture um, as opposed to another picture I love because it brings up an incredible memory of an experience that I've had. And you connect through memory. Um, I don't know how other people think, but my memory thinks in like, um, like a slideshow. I have like snapshots of all these experiences in my life that come up and they're like little pop-up pictures like, oh, I remember that. And, you know, if I, if I connect to something, I literally feel, um, oh, wow, I remember that. And then you get the feeling of the emotion from the moment of when you experience that. And so I think when I paint, I know when the artwork is right because I know I'm connecting with it. I know I've got it to a level that, yes, I can feel that feeling in the painting. I can feel that um, experience that I've had and I can feel the circumstance of, of the surroundings, you know, the canvas or the paper might only be, you know, um, 38 by 55 or, you know, 75 by by 55 or whatever, but your imagination is bigger than that page and you're just capturing a piece of it. And it's how you, um, you, I suppose, can put the marks on the page to try and connect people to, um, I don't know, moments. I, I don't know how to explain it because I, I definitely connect to moments. So good. And I think that you nailed it. You nailed it. And, um, the thing I feel people would really want to know from you is when will they know, well, when did you know that it was time to start putting these rock paintings into a show? Because you're known for these now and you've gotten really amazing awards for them. So when did you yes. know it was time to put them out there? I think um, as an artist that's been exhibiting for so long, I work on a body of work that has some kind of continuity for each show. I try and exhibit every second year as a solo artist and then every other year in joint and group shows. Um, I think as my watercolour world has expanded, I've been invited to more and more international shows where I have to select a piece. Um, and the journey of the rocks was something that I, I think that was my discovery in watercolour and it has grown so much. I've painted hundreds and hundreds of these particular paintings and it's those hundreds and hundreds that make them good. It's not the first one that was good. Um, but I must say some of the early ones I really still absolutely love. And I think that was because I found success in them. So once you feel like you've found success in something, you want to do more, how do you improve it? Um, and then I went on a journey um, with an art mentor. Um, I sort of got to a point where I felt stale. Um, as a studio artist, you're often alone, you're not connecting um, directly on that, uh, I think, professional level um, with another artist all the time that's sort of giving you, um, I don't know, direction or, or contemplation of where you're at or or opinion about what they think, is it working or not, you're working alone. And I got to the point that I felt like I wanted to grow and um, through that mentoring process um, I did a, um, a mind map of, of where I was, where I'd like to be, and then I suppose joining the dots of how to get there. And one of the things that we discussed heavily in, in that mentoring process was um, to be like this amazing artist in this world. I'm just one of millions and millions of amazing artists in this world. Um, but to be known for something, you have to be recognisable. And painting willy-nilly or painting like everybody else, um, you become one of a style of artists but not an individual. And my rock work was one thing that really stood out as an individual thing. Um, nobody does it like me. Nobody paints rocks like me. There's plenty of people that paint rocks, but I paint them really differently to other people. So it was my little ticket of individuality. And so that mentoring process encouraged me to expand my folio to have a lot of rock work in it um, so that I could share 
that I was not just skilled at a painter but skilled at reproducing the same kind of work because I understood the topic, I understood the techniques and I understood the, um, the, the ability to actually recreate these, um, you know, really imaginative scenes over and over again. So that's why there's rock work in my paintings and they have been probably for the last 15 years I've been doing the rock work for. Um, predominantly it's become more internationally known over the last three, seven years, um, which has been a part of that mentoring process where I stepped up my, my curve and, and connected with a lot more, not just local, not just national, but international groups, which has given me some amazing opportunities um, including being selected in the top 60 of the world in Cordette and being becoming a brand ambassador for Daniel Smith and lots of just incredible, you know, opportunities that have come from people recognising I have a skill and that skill was because I had the ability to not have an accidental great painting, but I knew how to paint it over and over again. I love this. I love, you know, we haven't really touched much on, like, uh, paintings that are done serials you know like a series of painting and you just gave an amazing picture of what it looks like to work on a body of work for a certain amount of time there's people out there they're like oh i've been already out there painting with you gabriel mm -hmm. Well, and I'm like, well, we weren't painting here in the summertime. We came here on a cloudy, wintry time. So this is, should be a totally different painting. And, you know, and I love the fact that you just shared that, you know, it takes time. It can be taught, but it takes time. And it it's not, you know, one and done. It's just mastery. And another thing I love about you is you've gone through the whole line of Daniel Smith colors. Uh, I've seen you do stuff with iridescence, the permatex, the quinacridones. Like, I can go to you and go, hey, what colors, you know, does, uh, you know, Sargent uh, use that are similar to our Daniel Smith colors? And you're like, I got that information. I love that about you. Uh, the question I think um, I also want to ask is, uh, so um, you do... You're, you're a teacher, and how long have you been teaching? And what is that, how is that rewarding for you as a teacher? I think because I've worked in the school system for, since my mid-20s, I just had a passion for encouraging other people. Um, so the journey has just been everlasting um, in all those years. And um, having um, wonderful opportunities to be an invited artist demonstrating or showing or mentoring or whatever it may be, I think I actually feel it's a true gift to share that. that. And, um, in fact, we talked about COVID before and when COVID shut down and I couldn't, you know, interact with my students and I couldn't interact in the school system, my world was so shut down. And I found, even though I was connecting with artists around the world online and having lovely chit chats, I found it really, um, um, I really missed that interaction of sharing. So I think it's my passion for sharing is as big as my art passion for my actual doing my own work. And that was actually my next question was, you know, <laughs> like uh, teaching people, um, how has that rolled over into your own artwork? I think um, I really love to share the knowledge and I'm a really explorative person. I'm not happy just to say this is how it's done and you just do it that way, like making a cake is the recipe, just do it. I really like to step over the boundaries. I really like to test, um, you know, where it can be pushed. Um, I love history of art. Things like, you know, um, exploring somebody else's palette. How did they make it? Because they don't necessarily write it up. So I, you know, get on a little journey and, and, and play with all the colours and try and colour match and, and, um, and you know, trialling different mediums together. So I'm using mixed media, trialling, um, I suppose, anything that will take the fun of the journey even further 
and interacting with a whole classroom full of people means that you're sharing that journey. It means you don't just learn from your tutor, you learn from each other. Um, and seeing that one idea that I you know, come up with in my brain over, the, over a few weeks, I'm going to do that and I'm going to show people this and blah, 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 to actually see them perform those things from my imagination and lets me see the, um, the difference of how different marks can make it. I've got a whole bunch of people testing it for me technically. <laughs> so, yes, of course, it's really um, uh, ex uh, expanded my knowledge expanded um, my ability uh, because I get to see so many samples of my ideas um, through my teaching. I love that. I love, I love, I, the whole time when we were on the painting holiday, there was, you had an example for almost about anything and there was no BS. You, you had your facts straight, you know, and I love, there was one moment uh, we were playing with hematites, uh, scarlet, burnt scarlet hematite. And you're like, soak that paper really nice and wet and now put some paint. Now take a magnet and watch that. You can move that around. We show this to the kids. And I was like, no, she actually did it, folks. She's not just hearing this from some other YouTube show and now just uh, feeding us and tickling our ears like you've actually put in the time, the effort. Uh, what advice would you give to a new watercolors? Because this show is about watercolor. What advice would yeah. you give to a new person? Um, I think the biggest, two, two pieces of advice I give to all students is um, what you're working on is only a piece of paper. Stop being so precious. And also, if you think you're going to be an expert on your first painting, well, you're kidding yourself. So they're the two biggest pieces of advice I can give somebody, you know. When people get disappointed with what they've achieved on their first few goes, I'm going like, seriously, did you think you are going to be an expert in three hours? Um, yeah. So I think it's to be real, it takes time. It is give yourself the time to learn. I also encourage all people getting into watercolour is to is to go and try courses with lots of different tutors um, because each tutor will give their style, they'll share little tips. They some paint, you know, literally teach their own style, others teach a broad spectrum of technique and whatever, but every single tutor will give you knowledge and you will find your place with um, a foundation. Um, that you can build on. Um, you can't know it all up front and you have to just keep practicing. It's so true. I could I could tell you so many times on, you know, I have a, a five-week course here in San Diego and on the second class, they're already like, I'm done. I suck. I'm over this. I'm, I just throw, tear it up through that stretch. I was like, it's your second class. You've only had four hours of watercolor teaching and you want to just throw your hands up now and give up. I was like, give yourself some love right now. Come here, let me give you a big old hug. And you know, like I get the same thing too. People come out play, painting with me, plein air, and one little bug, you know, lands on their wet painting and they're like, this is it, that, this is it, I'm out of here. And I'm like, <laughs> Did you think you were going to paint an award-winning painting out here today on your first day? Like, come on. So that's wonderful advice. And actually, there was one time, there's actually several times, I grabbed out a piece of paper that might have got crimped or bent, and I'll spray it down and flip it over and wet it. And then uh, just work that painting, and then it's been an award winner. And I'm just like, yeah. I if I saw that little crimped or bent corner, I would have just yes. you know tossed it away. And some of those have been my best paintings. So that is a great thing of advice. Uh, yeah. What are some <laughs> other? What are some other subjects that you like to paint? Ah, oh, okay. Um, I love painting nature. I think I find the natural world incredibly amazing. Um, I think I, you know, I, I'm not a beach girl, quite honestly, even though I like to paint oceans. I'm a, I'm a rivers and streams and high country girl. Um, so, you know, standing on the top of, um, I don't know, 
the Pyrenees when I walk the Camino, you get this incredible, wow, look at that enormous, amazing scene that I'm looking at. So trying to capture those moments and it all, again, it's my emotional connection. It's not necessarily, you know, actually guaranteed it's going to be the same image, but it's the concept of it. So definitely um, landscape of sort. Um, I also have a strange thing that I do. I feel that when I paint, um, for example, I paint something from the ocean, I don't feel it's complete till I've painted something from the earth. So I actually do two paintings in any, in any series at the one time and they're like the yin and the yang of each other. And I feel one bounces off the other and they give completeness and it's just something that I've done by circumstance for years and years and I constantly do it. And um, when I have a piece that's standalone, it feels like it's missing its buddy. <laughs> it feels like it's not complete because it doesn't have a, a friend to sort of bounce off. So, um, yeah, so I think landscape is probably my biggest other topic. Um, I love quirky still life. I love Matisse style. I love, you know, uh, cubism. There's so many ideas that I absolutely adore in art, but I predominantly go back to landscape as my as my um, alternate to my rocks and river streams. That's wonderful. And I think there's probably someone with the algorithm has probably found this video that maybe they're thinking about going to your country. Uh, what what is the art scene like uh, out in your neck of the woods? Wow. The Australian art scene is quite amazing. We're a very modern country, so our artwork tends to be more towards the modern abstract. Um, the, the big galleries are, you know, full of amazing works, not just from Australian artists, of course, but from worldwide artists. Um, the local scenes, I live in, a, um, in the capital of Australia, in Canberra, and we are predominantly a public service town, as they say. So there is um, a heavy component of, um, of people that work for government. And so they're also, for that reason, all quite well income earners. So they have good hobby industry. So the art scene for that sort of grassroots um, people involved in their art interest is quite big in my own town. Um, I think different cities around Australia have a different influence in their art areas. Some is more towards theatre or music. Um, definitely um, the big galleries are, um, we've got the, of course, the, the National Gallery here in Canberra, but um, each state has got some most beautiful state galleries to, to visit. But the local small galleries is where you see the local people's work. And I think, you know, I think we're all modernists and, and we all create really interesting stuff and uh, Australians are quite bright and bold with their colour. Um, we're not traditionalists in our style. That would be a, a good explanation of, of Australian artists. Um, but you could always join us, come to Australia in September. Hey, <laughs> we're having a big Australian watercolour muster encouraging artists from around the world to visit us. I'll put the link to that down in the show notes over there. And uh, I think people would also like to know, uh, you know so much about materials. You've tested the watercolor grounds. You've tested all the other different paints, cheap brushes, the expensive brushes. You've, yes. you've tested all the paper, you know, like, uh, is there anything you'd like to say about supplies? Uh, I think as a watercolorist, um, don't waste your money on cheap junky student quality stuff because you're not going to get a good result that's pure in colour, that's not muddy, um, it's going to behave right. If you can't afford to spend a lot, we'll start small, start with just a couple of colours. Um, you know, you can even get online and buy secondhand palettes from people. You don't have to have a lot of money to get yourself into, into a genuine, you know, um, quality paints. Um, but I, you know, I just highly recommend start with quality products and you'll get a better, get a better outcome. Um, in respect to brushes, there's beautiful brushes in this world, no, no, no question. And yes, they hold their tip fantastically and they paint 
gorgeously, but you can still do an amazing painting with a $2 brush. So really, um, I think your paper needs to be, you know, a reasonable quality watercolour paper. I, my, you know, my favourite is Arshas, of course, but, um, you know, I've tried, tried so many different ones. Our Hong's a great paper. Um, Saunders is one that I'm not much experienced with, but I know friends that are artist friends that are really love Saunders. Um, but if you go down to your $2 shop and you buy watercolour paper, or so, so it says it's watercolour paper, you're just buying junk tissue paper and you're actually not getting a true experience. So understand that certain things you have to have and certain things you can get by with. Um, good paper or uh, proper watercolour paper, I should say. There's lots of brands that give you different price ranges. Um, a reasonable brush, it doesn't have to be an expensive brush, but just use proper quality pigments. And, you know, I highly recommend Daniel Smith after going on a journey through so many brands in many, many years, buying them in massive quantities for schools because I had control of those budgets to, to choose whatever products I wanted. Um, I did make a, a conservative effort to change um, the school I worked at to all professional quality materials, uh, which we used a lot less of because the pigment levels were so much higher and therefore actually saved money by buying better quality to start with. Um, also understanding the, um, the care of a product, um, can it, will it dry on the pan or will it just crack off the pan? You know, things like that. You get to know the different brands. Daniel Smith is one of those ones that have don't do that. They re-wet perfectly. Um, setting up um, pans in my in my studio, um, without question, I can go back to that pan. You know, a week later, a month later, or six months later, and I can re-wet it instantly, and it's not cracked and dried and horrible and things like that. You buy student quality, and you won't see the same. So. Yep, don't have to spend a lot, start somewhere, but know that you need certain things to make a successful watercolour painting. That's so good, I agree. And yeah, I loved how you just summed that up. And I know some people, they want to just, they, they've never heard your story, but could you tell us how you became Brand Ambassador of Daniel Smith? Oh, wow, so... A few years back, I don't know, six or seven years ago, I um, came across a competition to enter an artwork into something in Italy, and it was called Fabriana in Aquarello. And I went, oh, never heard of that. That sounds like fun. I'll enter a work. And, yeah, about, I think it was Christmas Eve, I get a phone call from this lady in Queensland, and she said, oh, you've been selected in the top 30 of Australian artists to represent Australia in Italy. Can you imagine how that feels like as an artist and you do little shows and you sell work and, you know, it's like, oh, my gosh, I've been selected to, you know, be a part of the Australian team for Italy. So I had no idea anything about what I was doing and I was so excited. I was like, okay, we're going to Italy. So, of course, you know, the artwork went off to, to Italy with the, with the package of the Australian team and I bought airline tickets and I found myself um, on a wonderful journey with my husband um, a few little places and our last point of call was Fabriano and I turned up in this town, this tiny little town which I really probably would have bypassed on any normal tourist circuit to walk down a street that was full of artists. Like I literally just found my place. I just was so like my whole spirit came alive so much by being a part of this amazing festival and meeting people and, um, you know, chatting with people in the street, meeting artists that I'd followed for so long, you know, having people come up to me going, oh, my God, you're that Australian artist that paints rocks, you know, people recognising me in the street, things like that was really exciting. But um, there was a trade area and a wonderful Catherine and John um, were there showing off this um, really cool, uh, products from Daniel Smith. Now, I had tried Daniel Smith. I'd been using Holbein and Daniel Smith, um, you know, a few other different brands here and there. Um, so I was familiar with their products. I was familiar with what the, well, how beautiful their paints were. But I'd also done a lot of exploration on watercolour ground. It was really early in the story of watercolour ground. And I was chatting, chatting with Catherine and John uh, about my journey with watercolour ground and 
had all these suggestions, you know, you think when you've tried it all, you want you want more answers and all that sort of thing. And they're really intrigued with my interest in that. Um, I got a, um, when I got home, I got a private invitation from Catherine to put up a blog um, demonstrating something about the grounds, um, which I did do. So you can find that on the Daniel Smith um, pages. Um, if you Google Caroline Deeble and watercolour ground, you'll see um, a blog come up that I, I did a demonstration for. And my journey just grew with them. And I think in time, they come to realise that Caroline was a bit of a weird artist that tries really unusual yeah. things and, and you know, encourages people to explore and push the boundaries and things like that. So um, they welcome me into the team and, you know, wow, what a great family we have, Gabrielle. <laughs> well, it's a really lovely friendship group as well as, you know, we, we have the same interests and we have a genuine passion for what we do and to share that with you all is just been fantastic. That's so good. Like, I, I love hearing how, uh, you know, it just wasn't an overnight exet, a success, you know. There was, you know, preparation. You you had something to bring to the table. Uh, you, you had the, these are right here. And, you know, I love, that's what I love about you. You explore. And when we explore, we find new ways to lift, lift the house, you know, the roof on the house. When you explore, you create new memories in your bank, brain. So when you got a new project, and the other thing I love about you is you're a problem solver, and that's a big component about artists. And then yes. I know there's some people out there, if you're still watching this, and you haven't, and this is a question I'm keeping over into the new series, but uh, what would you say, Caroline, to someone that they should be doing art, they're amazing, but they haven't been painting? What would you suggest they to them? Uh, I think uh, people need to make time for their art. There's no question. Uh, it worries me that people that are quite talented in many ways walk away too quickly because they don't get instant results. And to encourage you to acknowledge you're not going to get an instant, you know, you're not going to be a professional in two seconds. Um, that takes time. Um, but I think the painting process itself is encouraging people to learn to understand the technical side of what they're doing is one part, but to actually enjoy the discovery and to take it, make it fun and to do topics that they're passionate about. You know, it's... Um, what do they say? If you have a job that you love because it's something you're passionate about, it's not like a job, is it? So if you are actually painting something you're passionate about, and there's no point going to somebody that paints oranges and lemons when you're really, really just trying to paint, paint fast cars. And, you know, you really need to do paint and involve yourself in that world of something that you are genuinely passionate about. And if painting is something that you need to be encouraged to do, um, I think the question is, is perhaps you need some technical guidance to give you the confidence and then you shouldn't need encouragement to paint because you'll just want to paint. That's, that's great advice from someone that is so wise and has had so much experience. <laughs> now, that I'm pretty sure someone's probably going to ask this, so I'm just going to ask, you know, do you okay. have kangaroos that come in your backyard? <laughs> or you see them going down the street? <laughs> People want to know if you see uh, alligators, like, is there wildlife in your neighbourhood? There's definitely wildlife in my neighbourhood. I think um, uh, we've been um, visited by at least 12 possums in the last few months and we had a um, wombat uh, burrowing under my studio, uh, which we had to have evicted by the special wombat catcher. <laughs> And we, yeah, kangaroos on my bottom lawn. I, I live on the side of a big reserve. So, of course, because I'm close to the reserve, but it's not unusual to see or hear that there's kangaroos up in the streets around the suburbs in my area. Um, I don't have crocodiles because I'm not in the tropical north. They, they, there's something specific to that area. Um, yes, we have snakes and spiders and, you know, all the things that it, they say is, is that in Australia, but guess what? There's so many of us Australians, we've survived it all. <laughs> That's so good. And do you have a do you have a phrase for us to learn? Uh, I think that would be funny. 
uh, we were, there was one dinner that we were having together. I think it was the last night and you guys just like squared me up on some good, good uh, Australian link. Uh, can you, can you give us an example of one? Oh, I have to think. I don't know. Um, uh, don't, don't forget your esky, mate. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> uh, it means that when you're coming along, you've got to bring a, um, a chili bean. A, um, I don't even know what you guys call it. It's like a, a covered box that's styrofoam that you can put ice in and you put drinks in. Um, nice box. So it, yeah, that's it. That's it. So it's like, you know, you don't say bring your own drinks. You just say don't forget your esky or, you know, bring your esky along, mate. Um, that means you need to bring it full, not empty. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. No, we. I think it's B.O.B., bring your own beer or something. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. A bit like that. I don't know. There's so many Aussie sayings and we don't realise that we're using them because it's just a part of our, you know, our language. Um, but you guys were having a ball laughing at us and some of the things we were saying. I was surrounded um, by Aussies realize. and we were loving it. You, I think you were just uh, giving us a taste what it would look like to come visit you. I wait for you to come and visit us. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I'm just waiting to do uh, some sales here and I'll be there. Uh, sell some paintings and get a substitute teacher for me. Yeah, no problem. And then the airplane, right? Uh, just a of personal course. jet. So uh, <laughs> we all wish. Right. Uh, so I think this has been wonderful, but there's so more, so much that uh, we didn't touch on. And I'm going to have to ask you to come back because we didn't talk about that jelly stuff you like to paint on. We, there's, oh, yeah. there's like so many cool other things that you've taught on. Uh, where would people yes. find you? What's the best way someone to get a hold of you or to uh, reach out? Okay, so I think um, my Facebook profile, uh, which is Caroline Devil, Australian watercolor artist, is one point. My Instagram, which is the Lake House Studio. Um, but if you Google my name, you'll find lots of ways to connect with me. I do have a website, but I'll, I'll admit it's something that I struggle to keep up to date with. I have so many things that keep me busy and it's not one of my priorities because I, I don't rely on my website for anything because I'm really well known and people find me just through literally Google my name. Yeah, and there's so many of your demos at the Daniel Smith website. If they go yeah. on the Daniel Smith's page and go over to the community tab and go to Brand Ambassadors, click on your name, there's some amazing demos where you just, you had stacks and stacks of examples to share. And uh, if you're thinking about doing uh, some iridescence and stuff, I know there's a demo and also the gouache too. So yeah, we're gonna have to have you come back. We're gonna talk gouache. And not just gouache, but the watercolor ground, for sure. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure, fantastic. Uh, th there's so much to share. I've been sharing it for the last how many years? And there's still more in my brain that I, I, have, I haven't shared yet. You're being so modest. It, I'm pretty sure it's decades, not years. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Caroline. I appreciate you. And I know someone is going to be very touched by this. They're going to want to reach out to you. Thank you so much. If you found uh, something in this or you have a question, put it down in the comments. And I'm pretty sure Caroline will get back to you as well or myself. But thank you so much for watching and have a wonderful day and keep painting, you guys. Bye. Thanks. See ya. I'll tell you what. This is such an amazing interview. I will definitely be watching this more than once myself because Caroline has this amazing heart to be a teacher and sharing her wealth of knowledge with many people around the world. And so thank you so much for being a part of these interviews. We're going to keep doing these. We might even have Caroline back on here. If you have any questions for her, put them down in the comments. I'm pretty sure she'll answer your questions. 
If you would like to see more of her, go ahead also down in the description. You will see links to go and see some more of her demos. Well, thank you so much. Have a wonderful time. And if you have any other questions about what we're doing in the future with this, or if you have any recommendations, put them down in the comments. And please, sharing's caring, and go ahead and smash that like button. Thank you so much for encouraging my behavior with these interviews, and have a wonderful day, and keep those brushes wet this week, and we'll see you next time when we interview other pro watercolor artists. Take care. See you. Bye.